Hello, I'm Daniel Benjamin, and I'm the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's Richard von Weizsäcker Lecture with our distinguished visitor, Gina McCarthy. The Richard von Weizsäcker Distinguished Visitorship was founded in honor of the former German federal president, uh, former Berlin mayor, and American Academy, A Academy founding member, who was one of the political and moral giants of post-war Germany. And uh, like our other founders, Richard von Weizsäcker believed that the Academy should provide a forum for outstanding American leaders across a wide range of fields to come meet and exchange ideas with their German counterparts and with the broader German public. And as you can see by the pictures in our foyer, if you haven't already noticed, uh, von Weizsäcker practiced what he preached and was a frequent visitor to the Academy. This visitorship was inaugurated by former president of the World Bank, James Wolfenson, in 2007. And I know I said that uh, it was supposed to bring uh, leading Americans. Wolfenson was uh, a born Australian who later took American citizenship. And so I'm proud that our first von Weizsäcker lecturer was an immigrant. Uh, among subsequent von Weizsäcker visitors have been uh, Senator Tom Daschle, my own former boss, Strobe Talbot, uh, Paul Volcker, uh, who ran the Federal Reserve, and many others. And tonight, I think we are making good again on Richard von Weizsäcker's vision by bringing Gina McCarthy to Berlin. Gina McCarthy first served, uh, I'm sorry, served as the first ever White House National Climate Advisor, uh, le leading the Climate Policy Office created by President Biden, and she was in that position from the first day of the new administration in 2021 until uh, September of 2022. And for those who know the White House, that is uh, like five marathons in a row. <laughs> Perhaps most importantly, during her time in office, Gina was one of the principal architects of the legislation that came to be known. We're now used to it, but somewhat bizarrely known as the Inflation Reduction Act. Not really so much about inflation. Gina can contradict me. Um, uh, the legislation involved transformational investments in infrastructure and the most consequential climate and clean energy legislation in US history, and quite possibly one of the most important steps to overhaul and modernize the American economy since, I don't know, the Depression. Uh, the legislation means for the first time America is on the path to credibly meeting its 2030 climate goals, including a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by up to 52% below 2005 levels. Its champions believe that it will have global consequences driving down the cost of deploying clean energy everywhere. Uh, I believe it was Alexis de Tocqueville who noted that Americans as a nation were slow to act, but having taken the decision to do so, would throw themselves into the effort with um, unparalleled energy. The IRA appears to be a case in point as the U.S. has gone from a laggard in climate change efforts to a major force. Gina has also served as administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency in the Obama administration. She served there from 2013 to 2017, and she was instrumental in enacting the Climate Action Plan, and her efforts led to the U.S. adoption of the COP21 Paris Agreement. Prior to her appointment as National Climate Advisor, Gina was President and CEO of the National Resources Defense Council, one of our greatest uh, environmental uh, NGOs. She has been a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and a professor of the practice of public health in the Department of Environmental Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, I, I think that uh, those of you who think we have an unholy uh, concentration of public health power here right now with the presence of uh, Harvey Feinberg and Mary Wilson, I'm sorry, we didn't plan on it this way, but so it goes. Anyway, she, was, she served as the director of the school's newly, newly created Center for Climate Health and the Global Environment. Gina served as the commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection, for which I, as a native of Connecticut, am grateful. She also held positions in the administrations of five Massachusetts governors. Uh, 
Along the way, she and her husband, Kenneth McCary, who I'm glad to say is here tonight, um, somehow found time to raise three children and now have three grandchildren. And if you're thinking that sounds great, they're ages one, two, and three. <laughs> Judging by the strength of Gina's convictions, I assume that all our dedicated environmentalists or soon will be. Um, let me just give you a uh, quick roadmap to this evening. Uh, Gina is going to provide brief introductory remarks. After that, she and I will um, uh, have a discussion. And um, we see an awful lot of climate talent in the room. So um, I will turn it over to you just as quickly as possible. Um, for those of you who are joining by Zoom, please submit your questions via the Q&A function in the Zoom uh, lecture. Uh, don't raise your hand. You will be doing it in a lonely forest. Um, so uh, we will do our best to get to all of your questions. Gina, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Daniel. And I really hate when people do my bio because it makes me feel so old. <laughs> because I am, actually. Um, but thank you for your hospitality um, and for the opportunity for, to be here at the American Academy. It's just an amazing experience, and people here seem so open and excited about the opportunity to spend some time to really reflect on what's important in their lives and what's important to all of us. So in my small way, I'll, I'll try to do the same thing. Uh, but it is really great to be in Germany, frankly. Um, it's exciting to see what's happening. It's exciting to talk to the advocates about what they're disappointed in and what their opportunities are. And it's exciting to find my speech actually on the podium. Um, I have actually had an experience where I went up to give a, quite a lengthy speech when the prior person not only picked it up but left. Uh, so it was a really interesting experience, and I think I was brilliant saying the same thing different ways over and over again. Um, but, but let me begin with a, a, a bottom line, and that is that I believe uh, strongly that a clean energy future is not only possible, I think it's already happening. It is underway. So I apologize for being an optimist, but you cannot bring me down. So whatever questions you want to ask, I'm going to fire them back, and I'm going to tell you that we are winning in this battle and we are going to win it, because we have no choice. You know, the story of humanity rising to the challenge of climate change is really all about ideas and technologies and opportunities that seemed absolutely impossible a short time ago until they weren't which is now, they became a reality. And yes, we have much work that we have to do, but we will only succeed if every once in a while we just celebrate how far we have come together. If we look at the milestones that we have already crossed and use that as motivations to stay focused. So that's what I hope our discussion is all about today. So let me start by telling you that, that I am an unabashed optimist, as I indicated. I have a lot, I think, to celebrate, and so much work I recognize has left to be done. But really, honestly, just look at where we started. I had brown hair when we started. <laughs> I not only didn't have grandchildren, I didn't have my three cherished children either. And maybe I was better off, I think that at certain times. But honestly, where we are today is not at all a reflection of where we used to be other than we worked hard, other than we worked together, other than we found partnerships and collaborations. You know, last year worldwide, the spending in carbon-free energy surpassed fossil fuel spending for the first time ever. Celebrate that. Our renewable share of the energy mix is expected to rise to 29% in 2022 and 35% in 2025. Celebrate that. 
And it seems we are entirely into what some are calling as a new industrial age for clean energy. In fact, the IEA predicts that we will see $650 billion of private investment in clean energy every year through at least 2030. Celebrate that. And by 2030, renewables are expected to supply 80 to 90 percent of the energy in the United States. I'm celebrating that. It's cheaper, <laughs> right? In fact, carbon emissions are bending in the right direction. Are they fast enough? No. Do we need to work harder? Absolutely. But we are making progress. And let's not forget that, because every day I see young people coming up to me in their faces express what their hearts are thinking, which is we are losing something and we are losing something big. I get it. But nobody responds to negativism. Everybody responds to saying we can do this and we are going to do it together. I am here in Germany because they need to do it and we need to do it together. That's what this is all about. Look, clean energy is not easy. We are fighting for our children's future. I know that. I see it in my face of my four grandchildren, the three teeny ones and one that's massively more uh, older, four years old. So I got a four, a three, a two, and an almost one. And if you don't think I'm working for them, you're wrong, because I ain't working for you. I am working for them. In Germany and the U.S., we need to speed up the deployment of clean energy in ways that do things that people can see benefit them. We need to grow jobs, and damn it, we can do that. We need to rebuild our economies so that they're stronger and ensure that democracies across the world remain stable and secure. Because if you don't think climate change is a national security problem, then you aren't looking with wide open eyes. Climate change is not about the planet. Yes, it's a planetary problem, but what it's about is the future of our democracies. It's about the future of our nation's security. It's about supporting developing countries that have been impacted by our emissions and deserve a shot at a clean energy future that brings them the kind of stability and prosperity that we enjoy and we are striving for more. This is what this effort is all about. So let me assure you that all the work that I am doing and accomplished in the Biden administration that we're talking about today, all the executive actions, all the investments, these are not going to go down the tubes, folks. We are going to fight for these every step of the way because that's what democracy is all about. That's what you do. You don't rest on your laurels. You demand that everything you said was of value in your country remains of value, and you're going to fight for it every step of the way. And if you think there aren't going to be 10, 12, 50, 150,000 people fighting against you, you're wrong. So we have to stand tall. And as many of you know or could guess from looking at me, I have been in government for decades and decades and decades. In fact, I have worked in total for six governors, five of whom were Republican and two presidents, neither of which was Republican. And I, and I have remained strongly committed to climate action because those two presidents and those governors were committed to climate action. They spoke to me and what I want in my life. And so I am joined by the President Biden's team and many members that, that may have been in the government and are now out of government as an incredible opportunity for us to continue to push for change. You know, I was absolutely a, a joy to be the first national climate advisor, and that wasn't for me. It was because President Biden was absolutely committed to climate action. Let me say that again absolutely committed. He knew that climate change wasn't going to drag down his administration if he talked about it or delay his efforts to start a post-COVID economic recovery. Just the opposite. 
He knew that climate change would be the driver of our country's recovery. That was new to me. Because I was the EPA administrator, everybody always hated me. I did regulations that nobody wanted, but it made change that everybody needed and in the end knew would make their lives better. So now I'm, I'm excited to be here because climate action was no longer a detriment. It was all about building the economy of the future. It's a future where fossil fuels no longer win the battle for the hearts and minds and pocketbooks of the American public, nor should they win the pocketbooks, minds, or, or hearts and minds of any other community. We have to keep moving forward. And it's a future that would push all of the climate skeptics aside and put the U.S. in a leadership position again. So after 20 years of local and state efforts to develop new policies and practices in the United States, Joe Biden just grabbed it and said the solutions we need to make progress on climate are actually here. They're here for us to grab, so grab them. And he made climate his strongest commitment in his campaign, which is why I ran to join that commitment. So President Biden came into office and he knew he was going to invest in innovation again. He knew he had to jumpstart domestic manufacturing. He knew he had to rebuild the communities across the United States that had been left behind. We know who they are, the black and brown communities that never had a shot at a good future. And he developed an opportunity to turn that around. And in many ways, my little climate office was about finding that path forward, that sweet spot where we could take action on climate, but we could do it in a way that grew jobs, in a way that improved the health and lives and well-being of the communities that we were brought into office to serve. That's what this is all about. And we pushed hard. And we know we needed to do more in every sector of the economy. But frankly, without moving the legislation forward, we would not have been able to succeed. Not where we are today. And that success was about moving the bipartisan infrastructure law, moving forward with the Inflation Reduction Act, to win the passage of these and then the Chips and Science Act. So we were delivering investments for people that would advance their well-being, their lives, give them a strategy to know that we could jumpstart our economy and move forward together. Collectively, this gave us an ability to say that America was finally back on track. We existed again as the United States of America. Democracy was still alive and well with a White House that was working to lift the very people that brought President Biden into office to move us forward. We were open for business again. So folks, climate change isn't just about climate change, nor is it about immediate benefits. It is about saving our democracies. It is about national security. It is the foundation that we can use to make progress in all of these areas so that in every country, businesses across our, across our nations can find ways to actually want to grab a piece of this pie. That's what they want to do in the United States in this scrambling. In fact, since passage of the IRA last August, clean energy projects have, have resulted in 142,000 plus jobs across 41 states. That matters to people. That matters to our communities and our families. Blue and red states alike are being invested in where the majority of the funding is going to the red states. So tell me that this has no lasting consequence, because it does. So it's exciting. It represents more than $242 billion in clean energy investments already. And that's just since the law was passed late last year. So we are on track. We know we have to do it. We have to do it to celebrate together as partners and allies. I am here because Germany is working hard and I'd like to work hard together.
I'm here because the EU, EU matters. We are allies with the European Union. And I want to make sure that every step of the way, we are working together. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that. That was great. So um, I'm going to pepper you with a few quick questions, and then we will open it up. So um, you and I have talked about this today, and I am asking this question because I know that you're an optimist about this, but anyone sitting in Europe and looking at the, at the uh, past of American action on climate would have to say it was usually two steps forward and then four years or eight years later, two or three steps back. Why is this different? Uh, I, I, I hit this a little bit, but let me, let me give you a clear example. And, and first of all, that it's really hard to reject investment in your communities. If you're an elected official, you don't give up money that's given to your communities. If you do, you don't have a long history in politics. But it, the, the thing that, that struck me the most was when we were doing one of the investments we were making through the Inflation Reduction Act was what oh, was it the IR the bipartisan infrastructure law but it was i guess that was it that we were making a big investment in infrastructure for electric vehicles because we had had huge success in working with the united auto workers and working with the automakers to sort of recognize that electric vehicles are the future and we want to grab those and so we there was a investment of $500,000 that was going to be allocated to the states. And the question was would everybody reject that because in COVID some of the money that was given out for COVID actually the governors just sat on it because they didn't want to admit that there was a COVID problem. That's a problem in and of itself. But but the, what happened was they all had to submit plans for how they would develop their EV infrastructure. And it turned out that none of them wanted to be the state that everybody drove around. <laughs> around, <laughs> not through, around. We got 50 very sophisticated, well thought out plans for how to do e the EV uh, uh, charging stations. I never expected that. I, n I never expected it because I expected that they would reject that idea in some states. They didn't. And that's because it mattered to them. That's because we kept it low profile, we didn't tout it, we didn't make, oh look, everybody agrees. We just simply did it as a matter of course. And so it gave me a hint that maybe we had an opportunity here to not make this a political issue, but instead to make an issue about how the United States grows its economy. And that's how President Biden had, has tackled it, how he, how he has framed it, and we have done nothing to point fingers at anybody, but instead to just make sure that everybody feels that the, the resources that we're providing will go to the, the, the places most where those resources are most needed. If you do that and just shut up and don't gloat, you can do okay. That doesn't often happen with politicians. That is a true statement. <laughs> um, so you talked a little bit about the uh, U.S. German and more broadly Euro U.S. European relationship mm. on climate. Um, put your finger in the wind and tell us where it's all going in the future. And also, you know, the the question here and in, in many rooms uh, across Germany will be. Uh, if you're really working together, why are you trying to suck all the R&D money out of, uh, uh, out of Europe? <laughs> <laughs> did you make that up? You made that question up. Um, I did it all by myself. <laughs> yeah. I don't think, uh, it, it, it's amazing though, uh, it, we're not sucking all of the R&D money, let me just put it that way. We're sucking all the R&D, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, <laughs> R&D is good, uh, it re that's, that stands for research and development, which is always a good thing. Um, but I, what, I'm, what I'm hearing most about, and let, let's just hit the nail on the head, is basically that the Inflation Reduction Act is protectionism. And I, and I get that, I understand why that, that is a criticism. So let's just talk that through. 
you know, the, the, the president was very clear that there are things that we know we have to do together. And, and he, we also, he, I think he's also made it clear in the way in which he's framed the, in the, uh, the IRA is that th there is only one section that actually requires domestic content. One out of all the provisions in this 300 and some odd pages. And it has to do with electric vehicles. And apparently that has been perceived as a bit of a poke in the eye. And I think we need to address that issue. I mean, and it, and it is being addressed as we speak. You know, we've had, uh, the president has had conversations with the EU, conversations with, with Germany to make sure that, that we can come to a solution that allows us to work together. There is no bigger ally but for the United States than the EU on this or any issue. And there's no bigger opportunity, I think, than the Inflation Reduction Act and making sure that it is benefiting all of us. Um, and so that will be worked through. But it is a big deal. But honestly, we lost millions of jobs during the pandemic. Millions of jobs. We have an entire Ohio River Valley that lost manufacturing. We had to work hard with the labor community, the UAW in particular, because it was the first sector in, in which we were able to really move forward. And we work with them, and they were worried that they were going to lose jobs because there were less parts with electric vehicles than there are with fossil fuel vehicles. I know. Well, what if you double your manufacturing? Doesn't that take care of it? We were not expanding our manufacturing base at all. And so the trick was we, we worked with them and said, listen, we are going to drive investment to have more manufacturing of electric vehicles so you won't have to worry about the future because the future is electric vehicles. And they agreed and they went with it and we moved it forward. We have to have those same conversations because President Biden was very clear and I think what folks are worried about here is the idea that they will lose significant jobs. Now, there is no question that that's a big threat that people ought to be concerned about. We had the same concern. We ended up making sure that we were retraining folks that were going out of the coal sector to give them an opportunity to do other work. That was absolutely essential. But the whole point is to have people working to grow the economy and, frankly, to keep re-educating ourselves and, and our workers on how they can be part of the economy of the future, not the past. Wouldn't that was a long answer, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I actually answered many questions that were not asked of me. <laughs> Well, you've preempted me. Yeah. Um, well, yours was harder than the one wouldn't, I answered. <laughs> wouldn't you agree that it's not just two years of jobs from the pandemic that were lost, but 30 years of jobs Awful. from yeah. globalization? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that uh, most of our, many of our German friends certainly recognize it, but, you know, there's a, as one German friend of mine put it, there's a qualitative difference between our experiences which is Germany was a winner of globalization yeah. and the U.S. to we a large want. extent was yeah. a loser. Yeah. Um, but we don't want to make sure we do the opposite either. Right. Uh, so that's important. Um, and uh, what about, um, you know, you at the U.S. Uh, as a leader on climate now more broadly, not just in its uh, relationship uh, with Europe, um, in which you know the the um, the issues of trade and subsidies are certainly real, but uh, also um, you know the developing world, which has been such mm -hmm. a big story yeah. in uh, the evolution of, the, of cl climate as an issue. Well, it, you know the the United States, um, in, in terms of of the administration, President Biden has really understands that we have an, an absolute uh, obligation to fund um, a climate action in the developing world. Um, it, but he's yet to be able to get Congress 
to actually approve at the level that, that he feels is necessary and essential to meet our obligation. It's a, 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 uh, a point of big contention, and it should be. You know, I think, I think the developing world, the exciting thing about Sham al-Sheikh when, was, that, that was that, you know, it was a time when the developing world got to stand up and have their voices heard. It, and, and I think it was great. It reverberated. And it sent a clear signal that they're not going to sit quietly into the night and take all of the emissions that we deliver to them and all the damages that are associated with those emissions and simply take it. Um, but it's, it, it's proven to be enormously uh, challenging uh, within, the, within, the, within Congress and the U.S. Um, I can't really explain to you why. Um, I don't think anybody could, other than it's become a very partisan issue. Um, I wish we could resolve it, and I think there are folks that are working hard to try to do that. Um, but, uh, but at this point, it just remains very challenging. And so the thing that I've, I've personally been trying to do is to figure out how to get private sector investment um, in these countries, which I think is very possible. Um, but it, it remained, it doesn't uh, so, solve the, our obligation that we have um, as a country, but at least it will continue to have uh, improvements in countries consistent with some of them having very strong and good uh, net zero plans, which is what my hope is. If I can just come back to the subsidies for one second. Uh -huh. One of your uh, former colleagues who, um, like most of your former colleagues, wouldn't go by name, uh, when quoted in the paper, said, uh, the idea here is um, not, that, not so much that we you know, ruin everyone's day by becoming protectionists, but that our European friends start developing and providing subsidies as well. Um, We're always so gracious. <laughs> Is well, there a question? That was the question. Would you, <laughs> would you agree with that? <clears throat> Boy, it sounds like kids playing on a playground. I'm not into that. <laughs> you know, I, I think that, that we are partners with the EU and we both have to step up. That's as simple. But I cannot poke my finger in the eye of the EU for failing to do something that I can't get done in the internet that I that we can't get done in the United States. No, no, I'm talking about the subsidies again. Not oh. The, oh, not, oh, not, right. uh, not, not subsidies to the developing world. I meant the, uh, the IRA subsidies. In other words, is it the idea, would you agree that a lot in the administration are hoping that this issue goes away with Europe actually increasing its investments in, in, uh, in European clean energy? Sorry about that's okay. I'm about used to missing it. this. I wasn't it's clear. been a really long plane ride in the <laughs> day. Um, no, and you weren't clear. I just wanted to make yeah. No, I wasn't. <laughs> um, you, you know, I, I, this this isn't a race or about who's doing what to home. You know, we move forward with very strong um, opportunity for electric vehicles to be produced in in. Uh, in, in our country, and that's a good thing because that's what we need. Our biggest source of pollution is the transportation sector by far. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so we were following where the greenhouse gases are being emitted and how to take care of it. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't be working with the EU to ensure that we're not putting a any more barriers in the way of their success as well. But I don't see how we, we could. I mean, I think there's a necessity for the EU to, to really consider a similar action would be good. But uh, I do think there's going to be a lot of, of conversations between us and the EU, EU to make sure that we continue to have a strong partnership. So I had one more question, then we'll open it up. And I reserve the right to have another one after that <laughs> later on. Um, when I look at how the U.S. Um, the tr US trajectory on climate, um, I'm very excited about what 
uh, IRA has, uh, ha has done and will do. Um, but I'm almost as worried uh, about the dismantling of our regulatory agencies, especially by the courts, um, which seem to be hell-bent on taking away all the authorities that we thought they had uh, for the last 75, 80 years. And uh, I was curious if you would hazard a, an evaluation of that. I mean, your own former agency has, has suffered in this regard, uh, that is the EPA, and I'm curious um, whether you think uh, that this, this tendency to, as it's been said, dismantle the administrative state uh, is just going to keep on going. Well, as you probably guess, I personally have a lot of disagreement with some of the decisions at the Supreme Court. <laughs> surprise, surprise for everybody. Um, but, you know, we, we have to put things in perspective. You know, EPA just put out a proposed rule on, on basically car standards that really drive continued investment in electric vehicles. They've recently put out a methane reduction rule that's also going to, to drive significant change. You know, they're like a little machine, and I just love them. Um, you know, they're, they're, you look at what the law says, you do what the law says, and then you fight to make sure that, you know, it, its legal underpinnings are upheld. There is nothing that they can do other than that, we, because we have a Supreme Court and it is what it is. And so we'll keep pushing, but the one thing that gives me a lot of comfort is the fact that I was the one um, at, at EPA that, that uh, oversaw the agency when we did the Clean Power Plan, which was our first real foray into regulating carbon emissions from the power sector. And, and we thought we were like wicked, I thought it was wicked aggressive, that's a technical term that you from, can learn over from time. Boston, yes. Yeah, I, 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 I from what a surprise! Did you get? Did you catch my accent at all? <laughs> um, uh, and 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 basically, uh, w before it even went anywhere, it was stopped by one of the justices of the Supreme Court from going into effect. That was the first time ever that they never even had a hearing about it. They just stopped it because they heard about it, right? And so I knew we were in trouble then. That was a pretty good message. But, but what, I, what we found out is as much as we used as much leverage as we could under the law, we found out that even though it never went into effect, within three years we had accomplished reductions that were exactly the same as what we would have achieved by 2030 because we sent a signal to the industry. And that industry knew it had choices other than coal and that coal wasn't going to be the fuel of choice. So if you think about it, it's just we were doing our jobs, but also recognizing that the world was changing. And the industry itself doesn't want to be out of the loop of that. They don't want us to demand it. They want to be ahead of it. And the signal was sent, things happened, and yes, we lost that case. But life goes on, and you do it again, and you do exactly what the law says to do it again. And you hope that over time the Supreme Court changes, but in the meantime, you do your job. There's nothing else you can do if you're a democracy and you act like one. Questions? Why don't we start right here, because that was a fast hand. <laughs> Gina, thank you very much for your talk today. And um, as I um, introduced myself to you earlier, my name is Paul Hawkins, and I'm right for Foreign Policy Magazine. You say that you're optimistic about renewable energy. And from what I understand, though, you do include nuclear energy, which you didn't mention tonight, among, um, among renewable energy, yep. so as clean energy. And it surprises me because, I mean, study after study, the facts and figures show that nuclear energy is way too expensive. I mean, per kilowatt, it's four times more expensive than wind or solar. Um, it takes way too long to roll out, five times as long as wind and solar parks. I mean, perhaps, perhaps that's the reason that in the United States over the last 30 years, one nuclear plant has been built, and right now there are none under construction. 
It's much the same uh, story here in Europe, in, in Finland, one since 2000. It's too dangerous. It's too toxic. This is the reason that Germans, after 50 years of discussion, decided to shut down their nuclear reactors. And it's indeed, you know, half of the European Union countries don't have or don't want nuclear energy. Isn't Paul, every dollar spent on nuclear energy a waste? Isn't this is a waste of time and attention and, and energy and work and planning clarity? I, I, I'm actually not sure that this is money that's being spent to develop nuclear. This is an attempt by the administration to include all of the opportunities ahead. There is a lot of discussion in the U.S., not in terms of traditional nuclear, but in terms of these small modular reactors. You and I could agree or disagree on whether or not they're ever going to happen, but it's not like we're investing in them. We're providing opportunities for those that do to test it out and see whether or not they're viable. That's, that's what this is. So it is not, I'm going to build three and see what happens. And I'm not convinced that small modular reactors are going to be cost effective. I'm not convinced that anyone's going to want one. But we'll see. But if they do, there is an opportunity to advance this through a credit. That's what that says. So I wouldn't overreact in terms of, of our, we're investing in nuclear. We're not leaving it to the side. But there is, so there is an opportunity, and you could argue that opportunity is, is good or bad. Camilla uh, promised to ask an incredibly complicated question. So, so now, hi. Hi. So good to have you, and thank you for being there and for driving the agenda for, as you said, decades and decades and decades. We really need that. Thank you. Much appreciated. Now, um, to my questions. Um, one is, if we look at Germany right now, on the ground we see how the nitty-gritty challenges us implementing certain things. And that includes, for example, capacities, <coughs> time and knowledge on the ground at the local level. So I wonder what can we learn from America in this respect? How successful are you in this context? Second, you talked a lot about cooperation both with the EU, I like that, I'm transatlantic at heart, or also um, uh, with developing countries. But I didn't quite get how this cooperation either with the EU or with developing countries, what are the features of this cooperation? How can we actually fill it with content and passion? I yeah. would be happy to hear more about that. Thank you. I was hoping you didn't go to three because I'm too old to remember three things. <laughs> um, what was your first question? <laughs> you didn't even tell me about that fourth grandchild before. <laughs> <laughs> what was the first question? Uh, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it, I got it. Uh, I was just kidding. No, I really wasn't. But the, on, the, on the local, you know, in the U.S., um, I worked at the state level for over 20 years. There was a good reason for it. Nothing was happening at the federal government. Yeah, all of the action was local, and, and still a lot of it is. And so, so the local government doesn't have to wait for the federal government. It has its own authorities and moves forward, and it still will. You will still see California pushing for more. You'll still see Massachusetts actually pushing to revise the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and get it to do other things that they think will continue to push the federal level forward. So I have, I have great faith that people at the local level are pains in the butts and will keep moving and pushing as far and as fast as they can. And I love it. I, I think it's great. So a lot is going local. A lot of the money in the, in, in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act is money that goes to block grants for the states, in particular environmental justice communities. So they are for once going to have an opportunity for resources to invest in what they want. And so there is tremendous opportunities to move forward at the local level in a way that's either promoting what's happening in the Inflation Reduction Act or doing something different. And that's going to be a big deal. Because in the U.S., everything drives from the bottom up. Very few really new, interesting ideas happen at the federal level. Don't tell anybody I said that, but it's true. Um, everything gets tested at the, at the local level and moves forward. In terms of what, is, what does collaboration mean between the U.S. and the EU, you know, on, on things like the protectionism issue, you know, the, the one issue where domestic content is required is the EVs. 
and that's what's creating a lot of the anxiety. And those discussions will happen. The reason why I think the EU is so important is that you've been way ahead of us in some ways, in, in a lot of different ways, and, and we think that there is, is opportunities for us as democracies to try to align with one another and make sure that the, the vulnerabilities that were, became in such stark relief when the war in Ukraine broke out, it was staggering. It, it, we sort of, you had to step back and take a deep breath and say, wow, things have changed in a way that we just didn't anticipate and that we had to figure out how to deal with. And we're still dealing with that. And a lot of that has to do with exactly the same thing, climate. What, how you power systems and how you move forward. And there's going to be increasing need, I think, for democracies across the world to recognize that climate isn't a foo-foo issue. That's what I call it, foo-foo. You know, like hand, new handbags or something. This, this is a fundamental issue of how you protect democracies and how you have a country that is nationally secure. I think it's a big deal. I think it's a geopolitical issue that's hitting us in the face that we have never really faced directly. So while we're on democracy, uh, one of our viewers uh, writes in, decarbonization cannot be achieved worldwide without significantly higher energy prices. How can we reach the higher prices without endangering democracy and providing uh, involuntary support to populist parties? Uh, I, that's that's a, a, a two-step issue, the first of which I reject. <laughs> I just don't think that clean energy is more expensive. And therefore, I don't think we're arming populist parties. It's a, it, and I, I, I'm not trying to be trite about that, but data shows that that's simply not the case. And so the, I think the thing, we, one of the reasons why the Inflation Reduction Act is about incentives, not mandates, is that I, people can get very comfortable about their own choices in their own homes and in their own cities, which is fine. Um, but we're trying to entice new thinking about that. And I think that's important because I don't know about how the EU feels about this, but people get, don't like to be told but they don't mind being enticed. <laughs> and and the way, no matter how you look at it, clean energy is going to be the, the, the most cost-effective and, frankly, the most secure choice that people can make. Okay. We had a question right here. Ms. McCarthy, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Lisa Badum. I have been a member for the Green Party in the parliament since 2017 and my actual position is uh, I'm head of the subcommittee on climate and energy politics, international climate and energy politics. Great. Thank so, you for serving. Thank you for your input. This uh, was really an empowerment because we have a lot of struggles in the government right now but that's not my question. Um, I wanted to ask about the next um, climate conference and how the EU and US can work together and the transatlantic partnership can really thrive, um, can be a good factor for the climate conference. You said that it's difficult in the climate finance issue, mm. so difficult there. Could it be um, better to work together in the field of more ambitious targets, maybe, yes. where yeah. the US will yeah. Yeah, have somebody and um, something in, in this field um, to work together with? And the third thing I think is important is the end of fossil financing, the end of uh, financing new extraction of oil and gas. Yes. I mean, we know we have a problem in Europe at the moment with the energy crisis, but also in the US projects are going on and on, and also in combination with uh, CCS. Yeah. So do you think um, something in this direction could... Yeah come to a positive end? Uh, hard questions. Um, on your first, um, I, I think I should just admit that I'm not as close 
to what the U.S. is planning um, than I would have been had I remained in the administration. So I ha have to be careful to not make assumptions, but they have made an announcement of late, which is to really focus on methane uh, and, and to focus on, on carbon reductions uh, in other ways. So there's, uh, but it, it, I mean, neither of which is monumental, but building on capacity that they've been uh, sort of um, trying to nurture. So there's things to be done, but I, I, don't, I cannot make up more than that because I'm just not that close to it. Um, in terms of, of, of what, what, the, what the Germany is doing and what we're doing um, on, on uh, other efforts to try to uh, address climate, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, um, it's not easy to tell an, another country what they're doing or not doing. I, you know, I, I, I'm not you and I'm not... I'm not uh, leading this effort, in, and I, but I, I do think there's some lessons to be learned, um, and, and one of them is, uh, it, at least in, in my world, science matters and data is important. You know, people standing up and pontificating about what's worked and what hasn't without having a justification for it um, need to be challenged. You know, you need to get at, at real information. You need to build coalitions. And, and the, you know, we were talking about this a little bit at dinner. Is President Biden, and I know he's, you know, not a kid, but man, he had a coalition of young people that got him into office. And it's because he made sense. <laughs> it's because he made a commitment. And if Joe Biden is nothing else... It's an honest human being, and he, and he's been driving towards that commitment all along. And so, part of the challenge that I think we all have is to build really diverse coalitions, to get the labor community involved, to get young people involved, and to challenge when the data, when it's just a shot out of the dock statement rather than something that's meaningful and, and translated in, in real data. Um, I'm kind of a pain in the neck about that. I, I, I just think, I think change happens when people get real about things and not when they pontificate. So I would, I would caution that both of those things are really, really important. Coalitions, mostly. Which I think you guys have been working hard on. Over here. Yes, you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the very inspiring talk. My name is Simon Mueller. I'm with Agora Energiewende. It's a German energy and climate think tank. Okay. And I have a question regarding more of the engineering of the IRA. So you spoke a lot about how mm -hmm. to change the frame and also, um, you know, having incentives rather than regulation. So maybe looking at the experience that you made when making the clean power plan and now working on the IRA and building those coalitions, are there some practical things that you learned where you say, okay, we did this differently. How did you get bipartisan agreement? Because in Germany currently, we're increasingly seeing that the political divides on climate action are increasing. So anything in terms of, you know, yeah. practical considerations for creating consensus in an atmosphere yeah. which is divided, yeah. which I think was the case in the U.S. and still is. But, you know, those are, those are really good questions. And I, I mean, part of the it took a while to get the Inflation Reduction Act done. Um, it took a lot of communication. We didn't have a lot of wiggle room on, in terms of the number of votes. Um, we had to get folks in line on it. And, and really, it was just thoughtful discussions to try to avoid difficult points and find other ways around it. And it's just in, in the inflation, we started with the bipartisan infrastructure law on purpose because that was so bread and butter. What people didn't realize, I think, and, and don't realize if you don't spend time in the, across the U.S., is that we were in, you know, we hadn't invested in ourselves in friggin' decades. We just didn't spend any money. We didn't have real money for infrastructure. We don't have anything near 
the transportation infrastructure that you have. Nothing even close to it. And so the bipartisan infrastructure law had portions of it like building the grid, but it had building broadband. Can you imagine that people in the, in the United States don't have broadband? How does one exist? Well, your children might be flying into the night, running to another state, right? You need to have this stuff and to, to have corporations invest in, in your states. So it was, it was really an effort to make people realize that we had to spend money again, real money, on real infrastructure. It had water and wastewater money because we have many environmental justice communities that have neither. They just don't have them. So it was an, an effort to get people to understand that it was time to spend money again. And the, the Inflation Reduction Act was building on that. Yes, we did that. Yes, we now know we have to reinvest in ourselves. This was just an, another way to show that we could, we could invest in ourselves, but at the same time attract at least an equal amount of investment from the private sector so that we weren't having to foot all the bill, but we were providing an opportunity for people to understand that, that our country was falling behind because we spent many decades of, of acting like we were still on top when we weren't. And so it was, it, was, it was sequenced very carefully. It was positioned very differently, one to the other, um, and it ended up working. Um, but it did take a while to get done. But my, my least best quality, um, is my total impatience for anything. So I had to lock myself in a closet on any number of occasions and say, shut up, Gina, don't call the question. I did learn, never call the question until you're gonna win. That's the whole trick. Right over here, Louisa. Uh, hello, thank you so much for um, for speaking here tonight. I'm Luisa Neubauer. I'm a climate activist with the school strike um, movement. Um, maybe just one remark on, um, on 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 the transatlantic effect of the IRA that we noticed. Uh, just I think in the same week that it became public in the U.S. that this was happening, we spoke to a. Um, a quite important minister, and uh, we we proposed to do something similar because we thought, you know, it would be useful to have something. Yeah. And um, well, that minister denied um, the necessity because um, that minister felt, you know, the vibe was okay um, in 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 the country, and we wouldn't need that. And um, it was very very good, and for us a bit satisfying, to be honest, to see that over the last month that clearly changed. And I think it's wonderful, to be honest, to see that, you know, suddenly we get some real competition on better climate ideas because mm. for a long time this was about a competition about, you know, fooling the climate and greenwashing yourself out of real action. So I think flipping that around is something that we all really needed. Um, but yeah, to, to my question, because you talked about lessons learned and I think yeah. one thing that especially, of course, I mean, everyone, but I think in particular younger generations are really worried about is that, um, the question of time. Um, I mean, you know, we see, you, you, you pointed that out, we see dynamics going yeah. into, into yeah, good yeah. directions in many um, places. We see good investments, we see the renewables and those things coming along, but there's no match right now with the short <coughs> amount of time that we have left. And I mean, we know that climate action that is, you know, too slow, you know, it, it's it's... It's a good stuff, but it's not necessarily climate action because it, everything depends on time. And yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything that you that you've learned or that you can talk about in terms of how to speed up? You know, part of what we tr tried to figure out was to have have the right level of investment, because you know, frankly, when when you're trying to make changes in, like in and how homes are heated or how automobiles run, that kind of stuff. You know, you have to have a sense that you cannot get to 100%. You have to get to the right level so that, so that folks would take that on naturally and markets would continue to develop. 
And that's what we tried to do, was to make sure that we didn't cover everything without having significant resources in every one of those buckets. Because you do get to a tipping point where everybody wants it if 20% of the people have it. And it takes on a, a life of its own. And also, it takes, it, it, the costs usually get significantly lower over time. So we tried to do some gauging of whether or not we were at the right level and in the right markets. Um, but that, that's really the, the best that we could think of to do. And we will see whether we hit it or whether there's more investment that needs to be made. But I think in, the, in, in terms of the, the electricity, you, you know, in energy world, we're where we need to be. The question, the more difficult one is the homes and, and the, the community level spending, is how do we move that along quickly? I, I'm not convinced that there's a terrific strategy for that. Um, but I do think the energy world in the United States is going to change significantly um, and pretty quickly because um, they're primed for it. You asked me a second question. Okay, good. Simone. Yeah, maybe this is building a bit on what Louisa was asking as well. Um, I'm over here. Hi. Thank you for the discussion and I really I appreciate your enthusiasm and all of the positive messaging and facts that you gave us here? at the beginning. Upsetting. I'll try not to include a but. <laughs> I, think, I, th I think it's a question about potential lost opportunity and a lack of imagination. And I'll tell you what I'm thinking of. The last major energy transition that we went through as a global civilization was the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there weren't that many people thinking about the consequences of that energy transition, and yet now we live with the consequences of it. Mm -hmm. Now we have this opportunity to take on a new global energy transformation towards renewables, and it's really exciting to hear about all of the positive things that are happening in that space. But I wonder, too, if we aren't still thinking in the same kind of fossil fuel logics that we have been since the Industrial Revolution, since James Watt made that, uh, that steam yeah. engine, and whether we don't have an opportunity now to really make major transformational civilizational changes through this moment in history that we have this opportunity to, to live through and to be active in, in, in shaping yeah. and changing. So I'm thinking about cultures of consumption, about lifestyles that imagine and depend upon these sort of fossilized logics, and how we might think about transforming those kinds of attitudes mm -hmm. instead of just simply thinking of this as an opportunity to plug in electric where we had fossil fuels before, yeah. Yeah. right? And so I think that the, that the electric vehicles are a great example they're great, I have an electric car, but it's also, it's another individualized vehicle running on highways yeah, yeah. with major infrastructures, yeah. et cetera. So that's just one example. So I, the question is, because I know that Dan likes us to have a question, <laughs> are we having, is there a failure of imagination yeah. in this energy transition that we are undertaking? Uh, there may be. I mean, I can't say there is, is or there isn't. There's significant resources to try to build up our transportation system that's not just about vehicles. We, we're terrible. We have terrible transportation access in the U.S. It's just abysmal. I come here and I drool <laughs> at the uh, availability that, that you have for public transit. And so there's no question that that has to change. Um, and, and hopefully that will. But, I, you know, and you're, you're asking a very valid question. We all come from different places, but I find change to be very interesting. I'm a person that loves to change. I have this little trigger in my head that if I've had the same job for five years, I'm a loser. I have to try something different because you always want to keep challenging yourself to do something different. But, you know, in every politician I know runs on a change basis. I'm going to change the world. And people vote for them without question 
really, a lot of times. And guess what? As soon as they're in there, nobody wants to friggin' change a damn thing. <laughs> people are not predisposed for change. I don't think people like change. I think it makes people really nervous. I think they step back when you're suggesting change. So to me, I, 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 I don't know how you get to that freer and bigger question without people going, what the hell are you talking about? I need choices. I need either this or that, and, and, and we'll, we'll see what it means. But people, I just think human beings are predisposed to want certainty. They, they say otherwise, and people you know, pretend otherwise, but people like what they know. And, and they tend to not want to move. And the first time you tell them that they should, as opposed to tell them there are options that you can think about, I think you lose. That's just how I think democracy works. And so I, I hesitate to think that there's an, a more open pathway that, for choice. Um, maybe there is and maybe there should be. But people are really interesting. <laughs> Well, that's the last word on that do, subject. Do I have a deal for you? <laughs> right here. Thank you. My name is Henning von Santi. I'm a German uh, <coughs> environmental lawyer. Um, uh oh. America. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. Very, very interesting. Uh, America accounts for 15% of the CO2 uh, emission. Germany for 2%. It's only 17%. What do you think on the global scale, what to do there? What is the best method to uh, convince China, like having 28% of CO2 emissions? And then secondly, uh, the big problem, I think, is oil and gas accounting for 70% of the uh, uh, yeah. CO2 uh, yeah. emissions. Uh, and we have only, according to APCC, six years' time then... Yeah. Maybe m many measures might be unpredictable, or many uh, um, natural occurrence might be very unpredictable then. Um, do you think we need something, as Franklin Delano Roosevelt did uh, in the Second World War, when uh, stopping the car production and only having military production? That means yes. uh, uh, measures like this, or do you think the other way, that this uh, oil and gas that do 70% of what geothermal do, that we can force them into uh, going into geothermal, is that an option? Yeah. Really complex question. Um, I don't, uh, the, the fossil fuel companies are not going to go quietly into the night. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that, that's all, all there is to it. And, and I think, you know, we struggled a lot um, with uh, requirements in the U.S. to allow for, uh, oil and gas drilling on public lands. Um, uh, every time that the administration and the Department of the Interior tried to change that, they lost in court within seconds of the the league, you know, the the suit being filed. Um, and we purposely said that there's there's one other strategy, and that is to make clean energy competitive with fossil fuels. It, it, because it, the, if fossil fuels are more expensive, we have a shot at this. And we went all out to try to calculate what, what, how to make that transition. Uh, I think it's, it's enormously challenging now with fossil fuels because I think they know that their, their time is limited in the current system, not fast enough. We're not making that transition fast enough. But I also, you know, I also see them basically transferring a lot of oil into petrochemicals. And, and that's the same thing. <laughs> that, that, you know, and so it's, ve it's very challenging. And I, I don't know what the answer is. I know different things that we can do to change that dynamic. But I'd, I'd see that the fossil fuel companies really have to see that the, the product itself that they sell is not a product that is sustainable uh, for humanity. And, and if you can figure that out by suing them, fine. If you can figure it out one by one by making a, a, a transition 
So those companies find other ways to do their business, that'd be great. Uh, I don't have an answer for the question. Um, I do think it needs to be remain front and center because it is a very it is the f most intransigent problem that we face because they have so much money and frankly the war in Ukraine has only made them more and so that's part of the reason why I see this as a geopolitical national security mm -hmm. challenge for both our countries and for for others it is a big deal that was depressing. <laughs> it is. You're still a very upbeat person. Though. I am. I'm still very upbeat. Yeah. Um, another uh, question from a viewer. Uh, as someone who worked uh, at the EPA and as climate advisor, do you feel that our agenda has actually narrowed? We used to think about environmental protection, which included the protection of wildlife, dealing with air pollution, soil protection, etc. Now we seem to speak uh, only about climate in terms of CO2 reduction, climate neutrality, um, often irregardless of what it will do to the environment, animals, et cetera. So. Well, I have another EPA speech, if you'd like me to get up and, and give that. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I appreciate what, they're, what she's saying because there, there is a, a need to look at at the, natu the natural resources that we have and protect them. It's a need that needs to be recognized on the climate side as well. It's not, it's not just environmental. Um, but when I was at EPA, uh, the way I tried really to engage this more effectively was, uh, was to talk about public health. Um, and I know we've talked about this today with folks here that are expert in these areas. But I try to figure out how you communicate these challenges in a way that really relates to human beings. Part of the reason I'm an optimist is I don't think pessimism actually moves people. I think it tends to make them sit more firmly in their ass and not want to move it at all. And I shouldn't say ass, but I already did, so I'm sorry. On their butts, on their butt. Did I say it twice? I thought that was okay. an acronym for something. It was, it was, um, yeah, yeah, that, that's what it is. But it makes people just sit, sit still. And I, I, so EPA is actually in, in the Department of the Interior, which does a lot of the natural resource work. They're actually plugging along. Um, they had some rebuilding to do after the Trump administration because for some reason people in those agencies left. Um, I can't imagine why. Um, but they've been rebuilding, and, and I'm very pleasantly surprised to see a lot of rulemaking coming out of EPA because that rulemaking very often underpins a lot of the other efforts that are ongoing on climate. But there's no question we have to do some work on the natural resource side, both domestically and internationally. Or right here. Yeah, thanks for a great speech and your optimism. Um, Constance Haug from the Berlin Think and Do Tank Adelphi. I was going to ask about EPA rulemaking. So you've yeah. had a step at the Clean Power Plan during your tenure. Now I read the new uh, rules on regulating power yes. plant emissions are coming out. What do you think makes this time different? And how, how important is it even, given the changing economics of the electricity sector that you were referring to? Oh, it's actually a really big deal. Um, you know, when, when EPA regulates, it, it's regulating under very strong legal standards. You know, they've been doing it for a long time. There's ways of, of doing this that are very legally solid and difficult to undo. The Clean Power Plan was brand new in a brand new area, so that was sort of the exception. But when you regulate for um, you know, exposure of mercury from power plants, that's really hard to undo, and that puts constraints on the coal sector that are very meaningful and that really will underpin other strategies for how to start moving away from coal and into some better, um, cleaner resources. So there is this EPA's not just underpinning things, but they're providing an insurance policy that change will happen in a lot of these areas. And they're required to do it by law. It's just a marvelous thing. <laughs> you know, I have to do it. Yeah, I want to do it. Uh, 
So it's it's important, and they're they're being as far as I can see, they're being as aggressive as they ought to be, which is you follow the law, you look at what science says, you talk about the health impacts, you talk about the costs. If the health impacts and the value of those exceeds the cost, then you move forward, and that's what they're doing. So it's um, it's a tried and tested way of behaving for the EPA. Professor Newman, two questions at two events, my God. Hi, I'm Abe Newman. I'm a professor from Georgetown. I'm also a fellow here this uh, semester. And I also, I love your attitude and your presentation. It was so um, uh, needed, I think, on this topic. Um, my question is, uh, is the time question in the global, uh, putting it in the mm -hmm. global? And um, particularly, I, I find the Biden administration has, has become increasingly aggressive towards China and uh, especially towards China's technology sector and putting pressure on them. And what I see is their response is to start threatening the exports of sustainable technologies, uh, solar, wind, the different things that we need. And from what I understand, we just don't have the time frame to build that capacity, the manufacturing capacity that they have that we need to, to meet this challenge. So I'm yeah. worried about this clash of yeah. you know, the US becoming increasingly bellicose towards China and China basically suffocating us uh, from these technologies. And yeah. so I guess, I guess the question I have for you is what, is, what is your strategy to cooperate on some things with China that we need in the climate space while we're also becoming yeah. Uh, antagonistic in other spaces, and how can yeah. we keep those separate and uh, save the planet? I got it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it I, you know, go ahead. No, no. I was going to say we have no, we have high standards for our fellows. <laughs> it's a really good question. I mean, clearly. The tension between the U.S. and China is more than it certainly was when, when I was EPA administrator, which we had a lot of collaboration at that point in time. Um, I, there, I think there's two things, a couple of things going on. Well, many things going on. I think the government in China is very different today than it was you know, five or six years ago. Um, it, it, and so that is a change that has not been welcome, um, but, it, but has to be adjusted to. And it's really up to the president and his you know, team at, at the State Department to figure out how to deal with that relationship. The other thing is, and, it's, and, it's, and this is just maybe from my perch of where I am right now, trying to figure out you know, how you really get investment in the developing world, the, the challenge I'm seeing is that the Belt and Road Initiative for China was very successful. You know, they, they moved forward with a lot of infrastructure investment, but it meant that the countries that they were investing in were left with a lot of debt. And so it's, it's going to be very challenging to figure out how we, you know, move forward and establish a, a better and more lasting relationship with China under the current circumstances. I don't know what that magic is, um, but it's challenging. I really don't know. I have another question for you. Um, <clears throat> your career, your life has been devoted to? My husband. No, no. no. <laughs> and second place. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, well... I'm being silly. Go ahead. You know, you, you choose which is first. I was going to say, you know, uh, using science for the public's benefit. Yeah. And uh, it comes at a time when, you know, science is increasingly under fire. There are lots of people who really just don't believe in science. It's a bizarre period in which we've seen the scientific triumph of the fastest uh, uh, vaccines ever developed, saving millions of lives, and at the same time... You know, expertise is being denigrated everywhere. As someone who's spent their life in science and dealing with the public, um, how do we get out of this mess? Well, we've been hearing that for a long, for quite a while, actually, right? 
Yeah, no, I mean, that's not, that's not something new. Maybe it's getting louder than it used to be. It seems to me like it's gotten a little worse. But, but. I, I've always corrected people when they say believe, I believe or belief when it comes to science. I don't think it's a belief system. <laughs> I think it's factual basis for information as best as you can get it. So I, I, don't, I don't know if that will go away, but the reason it's there is people don't like the answers. Uh, and, and politically, they want to make hay about it, so those answers are in some way dismissed. And so we've had, we've had that going. If you're at EPA, you know that that's been a problem for as long as you've been at EPA, right? Because they don't want you to take action consistent with the law because it's, they see that it's not to their personal advantage. So they, they call it, um, they make it as make-believe, right? Um, but, you know, that's part of living in a democracy is you have science and you prove it and you stand by it. And you try to explain to people what you did, how you did it, why it's meaningful, why it's the best that science can deliver, and you go with the, you deal with the results. Um, you, I think the most important thing is that we don't back off, that we don't start getting wishy-washy, that we don't say, "Oh yeah, but," you know, there's no but about these things. You, you deal with it, and then you move forward, and hopefully you don't live to regret it. Or die young. All, one, the, one of the, all the way back there in the corner. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, rather than the actual policy, um, the uh, rollback after administrative change might be perhaps the more um, damaging element to, um, to uh, environmental policy. And my question is, do you have a, a silver bullet answer? To that, how can you prevent environmental policy becoming a partisan, partisan issue? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, um, it's all our uh, common lifeboat. The, the silver bullet, that, that there is none, obviously, and I, th I know you know that, but the silver bullet for me would be to make sure that we spend the Inflation Reduction Act money and we have an ability to talk about how meaning, what a meaningful impact it had in every community. That, to me, is what government's about. That's what I want to see. If there's significant delay in the spending of that money over the next couple of years and we don't have enough to tout, that would be hugely damaging to, to our ability to sort of um, make sure that the election was a meaningful one. Um, and, and, you know, you got to worry all the time. We live in a democracy. Things change. But it's really important, I think, and it was in this. I'm not suggesting that the Inflation Reduction Act or the bipartisan infrastructure law were timed to anybody's benefit. But frankly, I just need people to see that these were meaningful improvements in their lives, because that's what government's supposed to do. That's what being a public servant is all about. And I've spent my life doing that, and, and that's what's most meaningful to me in terms of how you leave. You leave knowing that you did the best you could, and people are seeing it. Um, it's, it's just not, it's, uh, it's not easy to go into an election if you can't point to progress made. And that's what this is all about. The gentleman with the baseball cap... Yeah, it's been answered. It's been the same, on the same. Oh my God! What do you got on the baseball cap? Is that I'm a shamrock? I'm afraid it may be a New York Yankees cap. No, it's a shamrock, isn't it? Oh, it's a shamrock. I love it. I I have my Red Sox cap up cap upstairs. We take a picture. <laughs> Craziest things happen at the Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? Sure, Louisa. What? Wait, you, but you do have to wait for the mic. <laughs> So I might stand up. Um, uh, so um, asking for the younger generation here, I feel a bit, you know, <laughs> um, tonight maybe that's necessary as well. Um, no fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> Do you feel alone? <laughs> um, so there has been a new, um, on the European continent, we've yeah. seen a, a, a new trend in climate communication, I would say, uh, which is um, about, like, telling the truth as a political 
approach, I would say, like the real truth, like the true truth, like President Macron going out last week, I think it was, declaring a national water emergency and then saying, and I quote, we have no re reason to assume that this is going to get any better. Um, that is what he just put out to the public because that's a reality of the, the water scarcity in France. And we have a um, minister in Germany, the minister of economy, who you know, went on national TV and said, our lifestyle is causing devastation and we are causing suffering by the way we live and by the way, by the way we protect our so-called wealth. Um, and you talked about how people don't want to change, but, you know, given that, um, you know, maybe, you know, um, how, do, how do you feel about, you know, maybe um, telling people that if we don't change almost everything, everything will be changed, not by design, but by yes, disaster. Right, so, right. you know, that we, but there will be this conversation at some point, right, about electric cars being great but also about you know necessity for drastic reduction of cars at all because we can't you know yep. have that yep. many of these um, um, you know machines um, and all the infrastructure that was mentioned or you know how um, you know change is an option you know for the industry but also um, the catastrophes aren't waiting for us to kind of make this option whenever we feel ready for this or when we have a good day, but these options will, you know, th these will fade away if we don't change fast enough. So um, I think it's beautiful to, you know, to take people from where they are and to, you know, to make sure that the lifestyles are addressed. But at some point, I think the realities of the ecological breakdown, they, you know, they, I'm yep, not sure if they always give that, uh, us yep. that option. Yep. Yeah. Well, let, let me um, respond to that by clarifying a couple of things. Um, I still believe that people are reluctant to change. And I, I won't, I mean, that is something that I've experienced. The question is whether they're right or wrong. And the question is not whether you articulate the challenge that you're facing in real terms, because you have to. And, and, and talk about it in a way that's real and that's based on the science as you understand it and the data that you have. That's not, that was never, it, to me, what I intended to project. What I in, intend to project is the fact that there are choices that can be made, but, but expecting people to do that on the basis of demand is probably not going to work. It has to be on an understanding of the problem. And it has to be a reality of the problem, but also it has to have a solution set. Um, that's, the, that's the issue. And when you get a solution set that matches the problem and advances it, you've got to run with that. And you've got to talk about it in a way that's hopeful and exciting and that moves people to change. Um, that, at least that's the, the framing that I have. So there, there is no question that I'm going to be optimistic about this because, you know, I've, I've had three kids. They all really don't respond much to punishment. <laughs> they respond a whole lot to yeses more than noes. So you've got to figure out how you get people excited and interested and engaged. That's the issue that I'm trying to resolve. It does not preclude... A, a, a very clear articulation of the problem. Uh, that has to be done as well. Because none of this is going to be easy. Um, it's, it's all very hard. But if you don't celebrate a step forward, you'll never take another step forward. You've got to rejuvenate with every small success and hope that they, they, it leads to a bigger one. But that does not mean in any way that you don't have to be realistic about the challenge ahead. Just be optimistic about the steps you can take and be challenging people to get excited about that so the next solution comes along. And, and I don't think I've ever seen anything like, I know I've never seen anything like the issue of climate change. It is just bafflingly difficult. And, uh, and it, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, and so I appreciate everybody who's engaged in this at every level. And frankly, I don't have, you know, all the answers. So I think that every way in which we can tackle this challenge is what we have to do. 
there'll be winners, there'll be losers, um, but we don't have any choice. My little cherubs, my not my children, they, they, can, they can step aside. It's my grandchildren I really like. Uh, so you've you got to work for them. It's all we got. It's all I got. Well, I think it's been a while since we had a talk that, com- that confronted the most baffling of issues and with so much optimism. So I want to thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.